start recording. So, um, and Sarah, I just want to make sure you got that email I sent you about that position in uh, in Danville, right? Yeah, yeah. I just, okay. um, I think I'm, I'm kind of committed to Oregon right now, and okay. I also just, I love hospice. I really love hospice. Well, this is close to hospice. It's it's pre hospice, if you will. No, it's 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 actually oh. a lot of hospice work too, because it's uh it's a it, but it's a very nice senior facility in Danville, uh and. And it's a little bit, it's a little bit different, I know. But uh, anyways, um, it yeah, is well, a, I'll look at it again. It's a Thank position. You for it. Yeah, I want to tell you something too. And, and folks, don't worry about this. But I will tell you, Cheryl and David Schulman, the position at Colleyville Synagogue is open, just so you know. <laughs> and it has nothing, it was open before the shooting or the, excuse me, the hostage, well, there was a shooting, but the hostage taking uh, situation, uh, that dramatic and, and uh, the heroic actions that the rabbi took, uh, he was, he was uh, essentially came to a conclusion with his congregation in, uh, in the fall and was staying, he stays on until June is when his contract is up. But uh, a lot of people, uh, well, some people know this story, but some people don't know that he actually was in a very weird situation because he's um he's not continuing he wasn't going to be continuing so uh that position i don't know if they filled it already and i don't know if he's now gotten a job somewhere else i would think that that would have helped his job search to put that on your resume but it is very weird that that happens and, it, and those things happen i mean i i it's not it just happening obviously in the rabbinic world it happens that people uh are are in a weird place at a weird time in a weird time in their lives. But again, you know, this guy who ended up, you know, saving, possibly saving lives in his, in his building. Uh, and, you know, look, nobody wants to be in that situation, but I think every, well, not every rabbi, but the, you know, the, every rabbi wants to be a superhero. Every rabbi wants to disable, you know, the intruder and, and uh, save the congregation uh, literally. And, and uh, this guy actually did that. And, uh, and the, the irony is, is that he was um, on his way out. So, and he was there 16 years. He wasn't there a short amount of time. It was, it was a, a good relationship. And um, the board basically had asked him to step down and, and, or, or to resign. They, were, they weren't renewing his contract. And uh, they, he didn't want to put it to a congregational vote because he didn't want to split the congregation. So, he was, he was, uh, he'd agreed to, to kind of step down. So um, very weird times we live in folks. Uh, those things happen though. And, and I'm not, I don't know. I don't know the backstory and I don't, I, I, you know, I heard some rumors and again, I don't know, you know, if it was, uh, it was what was reported and it was reported. They're not rumors. They were, they were actually reports about friction over politics in the synagogue. Uh, nothing bad about him or his behavior or or anything else, but there was some friction over over politics. That's which, really what makes thank you for the uh, story. Thank you for the story, Rabbi. I did not know, and it, here it is, in, right in my backyard. It seems likely. Yes, it was reported in the forward, and it was reported in JTA. So it was reported in national. I mean, they're Jewish sites, and I think it actually was covered in a couple of reports in the national news. But um, but it was in fact. Uh, so it's not, I'm not, I would never speak Lashon Haran. I would never spread gossip, but these are national stories. And, uh, and again, the, the allusions to why there were, why there, the allusions to why there were, there was friction was, uh, again, was in the articles. So um, I, I want to make it very clear that, again, there was nothing about his personal behavior or his uh, commitment to the synagogue, but it seemed as though that's what it was. And who knows, maybe, it, maybe there was something um, that, that they weren't happy with about his performance, but it seemed like it was unfortunately a matter of politics, which is dividing and, 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 and uh, tearing families apart. It's tearing uh, communities yeah. apart. And uh, it, it is not the reported story and it's not the, the immediate nationwide crisis we have with anti-semitism in this country but there is something also here if that is the story of how uh communities uh and 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 uh sacred communities congregations are being torn apart by politics which is uh another story and another important thing to address perhaps 
well, let's put it this way. It's much more common than, thank God, the, the story of, of hostage taking and, and drama right. and violence, because this is happening virtually in every family. It's happening almost in every right. community. It's happening in, in uh, office spaces and relationships that people have all around the country right now. That the that and everybody talks about it. So I'm not saying anything that people don't know, but the the toxicity and the level of animosity uh, that that's again. There's always been political differences. I mean, you know, we know that Aaron Burr and and Hamilton got you know got it in a in a gunfight over politics. So you know, we as bad as things are in in Congress right now, people aren't actually shooting each other in Congress. But but that being said, there is a level of hostility that is spilled over into the other spheres of our lives which is um it's it's exceptionally it's exceptionally distressing and again on a frequency level is more dangerous in many ways than than uh than anything else that we absolutely that we because divide and conquer has been a principle since communities started yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's happening. And it's a shame. Them. And it, and it's happening. Um, and it's happening at a level and a, and a frequency, as I said, where, wow. you know, uh, families always disagreed about politics, but we're, what we're seeing is, is that this is not generational. It's, it's, it's not generational, but it, it's also, um, it's also the, uh, the extremes of it and the levels of people cutting each other off. So, what I will say in the, in the midst of this is the takeaway from what, again, was maybe the, the bigger and more, a more um, pressing issue is that um, we have to learn from that and we have to make sure that, uh, that, um, that we, we, we don't have this uh, level of, 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 um, of animosity playing out. I know rabbis, there, there is a level of, of, politics to the job and, and and even national politics but that should not ever uh, slip over into the community dialogue to the level that 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 that, that could happen um, it is what's made um being a congregational rabbi unappealing to me is the politics of it yeah I and it's I yes can't imagine being with a community and and trying to do your best and then suddenly being told that they just don't want you there well, well, so that's the politics. That's the lowercase congregational uh, politics of, of relationships and the community. I'm talking about the political discourse that goes on uh, in the in the wider sphere, which is that people are are not able to discuss things, have disagreements, able to respect each other's differences, and so that they literally have to throw out. Um, throw out a, a pulpit leader because of that. And again, I, maybe he said something that was really was, was not right. Look, I'm going to tell you, I know this is the last thing I want to say about this, but, but politics. And again, Sarah, this is, this is an issue, which is a reason why rabbis are, are getting frustrated, but there, there is a disconnect in, in our country for the most part between most uh, reform and conservative rabbis and the communities that they serve. And, and again, without getting into specifics in this specific situation may or may not have been in, in, in Texas, um, that's what's reported, may not be the case. But what is happening on a national level is that for the most part, the rabbis of congregations are not in step with their the politics and the leanings of their congregation mm -hmm. so this is a problem that uh has been building for for over a generation yeah. uh and now it's gotten to the point where where uh, two generations ago now we're talking about the arguments were over civil rights or vietnam um and there were nuances and there were oftentimes i mean sometimes the issues were very serious today the issues have gotten so so toxic and so fundamentally uh, um, problematic because it gets to certain issues especially israel where where uh again when when some rabbis have 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 kind of really come out very vocally against israel it really hits a button for for congregations and i, I understand these rabbis are coming from a heartfelt place and it's not every rabbi and it's not every synagogue that has this problem but many of them have this problem that they are turning off their congregations because they are um 
they are really, they don't, they're, they're not articulating it. Now, again, it's a, the job of a rabbi to kind of, you know, to teach and to, and to give their uh, teachings. But the problem is that, that it's that for the most part, there's a, there is a, a shift. There's been a shift uh, that, that is really caused a huge and, and people aren't really talking about it. They're not, they're not talking about it until it becomes a problem. And there's not a, there's no one's addressing what that's going to mean for, for the congregations. So um, that's what I wanted to kind of share about that. I, again, I, I, I don't have a solution because no one I think is going to listen to me on this. And I, and again, you can't change people's minds on, on the fact that they have to be respectful of their, of their communities and again, I happen to be pretty, pretty passionate about my support for Israel. So I'm not necessarily the best person uh, for, I'm not, I, I really don't, I don't have a lot of um, tolerance for people that come into the synagogue and bash Israel from the pulpit. But that being said, that's, that is a problem. And, and uh, it's going to be a problem for the foreseeable future. And I don't have, I don't have a solution for it. I would, I would talk to rabbis about being sensitive uh, on that subject, but I, I don't think the people probably have made up their minds on that too. So with that being said, um, the, uh, today we're going to really focus on, again, for those who are, uh, who are joining us online um, on Facebook and in the world out there, we are, um, I'm going to pop up and share the, the screen. And again, for people that are joining us in Texas and Oregon and Inland Empire of California. Uh, for those who were not with us, though, last week, I want to let everybody know that um, we read the, the beginning of the story of Jacob and Esau, the story of how uh, Jacob ends up getting the birthright, the, the inheritance from his brother. And then uh, we read about um, Isaac, a very uh, weird kind of chapter where he essentially is, is, has to redig wells and kind of has a problem with the Canaanites. Um, and it's really one of the only chapters, well, let's put it this way. It's really the only chapter where we see Isaac actually moving as an individual without another family member, his son, his wife, his, um, his, bro, uh, no, not, not so much Ishmael, um, uh, really his, his, his father, uh, and his sons, uh, are always there. Chapter 26 is the only chapter where Isaac is kind of by himself. And, um, and the last thing that we read after we read about the wells and the, and the, and his servants, digging wells, is it says, when Esau was 40 years old, he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Be'eri, the Hittite, and Basimoth, actually, I don't even know if we read this part, daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they were a source of bitterness to Isaac and Rebekah. And so we read about Esau that he marries Canaanite women, Hittite, which are a subset of the Canaanites. He marries two of them, and uh, that is a problem for both his father and his mother. So if you, if you are thinking it's just that his Jewish mother is upset, his Jewish mother, by the way, Rebecca is from Abraham's family, right? He's, she's Abraham's uh, great niece, not niece, but one generation off. Uh, his, uh, her father is, is uh, Rebecca's father, Bethuel, is um, uh, Abraham's nephew and so this is his nephew's daughter so great niece uh so she's from the family but she also doesn't she's not happy about the 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 canaanite women and of course isaac who we know likes his son esau more we read that already that he he favors esau he doesn't like um he doesn't like it now Lest you think that Isaac and Rebecca argued over this, whereas Isaac took one side and Rebecca took the other, which kind of looks like by the English, it doesn't say that. It says there was an evil uh, or a bitter uh, ruach. There was a, this is why it's translated ruach as source, but it's also spirit. He created a bad spirit, a, a bad feeling uh, for 
Isaac and for Rebecca. It doesn't say between them. It says that it was bad for Isaac and it was bad for Rebecca. Uh, it didn't make him feel good. Morat Ruach is, a, it's not a good, it's, it's a bitter, a bitter feeling, a bitter spirit. And so we know that at least Isaac is not, is not okay with, with Esau when it comes to his choice of, of women. He's not okay with that. So today we're going to read the story and I don't know how much we're going to read beyond this. I, I will tell you the next 40 something verses that we read the story of this blessing being stolen is by itself has so much in it. I would probably read a little bit more beyond, but really we are going to look at this blessing uh, or blessings and we're going to look at them and understand that this is, there's a lot here. So it's related to what we read back in chapter 25, where Isaac, uh, where uh, Jacob takes the, uh, the birthright from his brother Esau. But now this is a separate story. Uh, are the two stories related? Absolutely. Are they, could they be read? Um, and they are read as part of the same portion, by the way. They're both part of the portion told out. So they are read together. We're reading them separately which has its advantages and disadvantages because you have to kind of recall what happens in that story. But this is really an interesting story on its own, even if it, again, maybe was written by a different author. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the authorship issue, but this is one of those areas where the more that I've thought about it, there's actually something to be said for looking at this and for us to maybe take a moment or two to talk about why there seems to be two things that go on here, two different things that go on here. So the story begins. So after the source of bitterness, it says, when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see, he called his older son Esau and said to him, my son. And he answered, here I am, which is another Hineni moment. Hine critical critical in this story is that Esau answers Hineni to his father which right away tells us that they have a relationship and that Esau has respect enough for his father to say the critical word of the bible Hineni here I am and again it's the same word that we see when Abraham says it uh or or when when Isaac, as a, as a child, said it back to father, Hineni. Uh, he, he, he's, it says he's old, and it says his eyes were too dim to see. Obviously, that's going to be important for the story. That's why it tells us he can't see well. But it's, it's, Esau, it's to Esau's credit that he says the words Hineni. And the fact that he calls him my son is a very intimate and very powerful call, which again reminds us of, of Abraham and Isaac, the generation before. Isaac says, I'm old now, and I do not know how soon I may die. Take your quiver, take your gear, your quiver and bow, and go out in the open and hunt me some game. Then prepare me a dish for me such as I like, and bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my inner, innermost blessing before I die. So, he says to him, I'm old now, and I do not know how soon I may die. So, in Isaac's mind, he's at the end of his life. Now, there's a problem here, and it may not be a problem from the standpoint of the writer who wrote this. And I, and that's kind of why I want to say this, because if we do the math, which the math is based on the priestly author who gives us the ages of how old people are when they die. If, if Isaac indeed dies at 180, he's only halfway through his life at this point. So he's maybe about 70, maybe he's about 80 or 90 years old, but he's got a lot of life left. Now, again, he had kids late. We know that he was 60 years old when he, when he, uh, sorry, when he had kids, 
according to the priestly author. But if he if he has kids late, then it's set up so that he still has 120 more years to live after they're born, which means they're they're I mean, it just said before this that I Esau was 40, which means Jacob is 40, they're twins, which means that maybe he's a hundred, you know, if those two dates line up and he's he'd be 100 but he's going to be living to 180 so he's not dying at least according to if we do that if we use that math and we say that the story was all one story so he's nowhere near dying now it could be that he really is about to die and at least this author thinks he's about to die and he really is giving his deathbed blessing um but his his eyesight being bad and it says he's old um that's critical to the story right and so when he sends his son out he tells him to go out hunt the game and he says you know what i like and that's what he says the stuff i like the stuff i love ahavti that same word that we had before when it said he loved the game that his son brought him same word there i love that stuff i wouldn't even say what i like but i guess you could translate ahav as like but it also is the word for love ahava i love that stuff bring it to me and then i'll give you my innermost blessing and that's the what that's the word that's used the the innermost blessing the blessing of truth the innermost truth that i'm going to give you from inside me now here's rebecca rebecca had been listening as isaac spoke to his son esau when Esau had gone out into the open to hunt game to bring home, Rebekah said to her son, Jacob, I overheard your father speaking to your brother Esau saying, bring me some game and prepare a dish for me to eat that I may bless you with the Lord's approval before I die. That's what Rebekah says. Okay, that's the end of the quote. Now she's going to tell him what to do, right? But before we get to that, just hold it a second. Because we are going to read the story carefully. She pretty much says what she heard her husband say, but that, but she added something to it. Do you see what she added to it? Right? The Lord's approval. Yeah, that's not what, that's not what Isaac said. He says, I'm going to give you my innermost blessing of truth, which, which is a beautiful thing to say, right? It's a beautiful thing to say, I'm going to give you my innermost blessing. But never, he never said, I'm going to give you God's approval. Rebecca has editorialized this and has now said, this is the blessing that I've been waiting for, for, for him to get from his father. He's now about to give it to the wrong son. Now, remember, she's the one who knows. She's the one who was told by God, there's two nations inside of you. And the younger one is the one who's supposed to be in charge, right? she's the one who knows that we assume maybe she told her husband i mean we can we can assume that doesn't i mean she's operating under that under that understanding and the hebrew says and and i will bless you um before 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 my god right and before i die it doesn't say mm -hmm. approval either right well, uh, well they yes, they translated the word leafne as before, right? Which yeah. they translated again leafne moti. L listen, the phrase in Hebrew is much more beautiful than the translation that you just had. I believe the translation does kind of kind of translate um well, but it's not as beautiful, it's not as poetic, and of course I'm going to turn to what Friedman how Friedman translated it, but it's more, it's, it's more, it's, it's more poetic in Hebrew, right? Because he says, I'm going to bless you, right? She's speaking, she's, Rebecca's saying what I, she heard Isaac say, which of course, not what Isaac said, but the way she says it is, leaf ne Adonai, leaf ne moti. So the before word leaf is there at first, right? But, yeah, before God and before I die. So I would have probably I know before God, you know, they've editorialized it or they've interpreted it to mean before God means with God's, you know, that I'm going to bless you in front of God before God, which means, you know, I have the power to give you that blessing. Um, 
Just because you you've left somebody in front of God doesn't mean that God approves of it, though. No, I, they've taken it to another level. There's no question. They've taken it to another level. But... Oh, and, and so, the other thing I noticed is um, because I know my middle name is Ada, which is was Esau's wife, one of Esau's wives, and um, and they it said here that um, um, Bamas or whatever is the daughter of Elon, and then later on it says that Ada is the daughter of Elon. Wait, wait until we get to that. But yes, you're you're right. There's a difference. There's like, a difference there, but, um, or, um, yes, there's a, some name changes. There's a difference there. Yes. Which could easily be explained if it's a different author, but again, uh, he translates it. Friedman translates it. Um, oh, I, I had it right there. Um, it says, um, she says to her, to, uh, to her son, I've heard your father say, I'll bless you in the presence of Adonai or yud Vafe before my death. So lifne he translates as in the presence, which is probably a better translation than with the approval. But in the presence of God is what I kind of said before God, before I die. But the but the but the phrase in Hebrew is so beautiful because the word lifne functions in both work in both places, and and it kind of does in English too. Because when we say I bless you before before God, you know, it doesn't mean like you know, it's, it doesn't mean I'm blessing you before God. It means in front of God, in the presence of God. When we say the word before, we sometimes use it as a synonym for presence, in the presence of, right? I, I stand before you, right? You know? So we still use that phrase. It, it could have worked both. I mean, you, I could have translated it that way. I would have said that I bless you before God, before I die. Anyways, that's what he, that's what she says. It's not what he said. That's what she says. So she's in edit. She's editorialized it. She's given her opinion on it. And again, in the translation, the translators then give their opinion of it. So here's her instructions. Now, my son, listen carefully as I instruct you. Go to the flock and fetch me two choice kids, and I will make of them a dish for your father, such as he likes. Then take it to your father to eat, in order that he may bless you before he dies. So do careful, you know, listen carefully. That's what she says. Listen carefully. I'm going to tell you what to do. Go out in the backyard and get those two goats and bring them in. And I will prepare it like he likes. I know the way he likes his food. I know what, I know what Asa's doing. I know what spices he's going to put in. I know what your father likes. I'm going to make it for him the way he likes it. And again, notice the theme here of food. Just as we had the stew, the lentil stew, the red stuff in the other story, this food, this preparation, meal preparation is very critical too. So food is really critical in both stories. It's not just about a birthright. It's not just about a blessing. Look at the backdrop for it. It's around a table, right? There's food involved in both stories. So, uh, and again, people say that's just what we do as Jews is we like to eat. Well, yes. And it also tells us that food is an expression of love, right? And so what is this? Uh, what is this? This is really making for their father a, a, a last meal, if you will. This is what he thinks. This might be my last meal. And this is what I want to have in my last meal. Um, so you know what's going to happen. Many of you know what's going to happen. You know, I just read this recently with some some of my students. So I said, uh, what do you think Jacob's going to say to this? And the next line, Jacob responds. And most of the times the kids say what they think normally a kid would do, by the way, which if you think about it as a kid, you were just told by your mother to trick your father. Now, maybe some of them have live that but that's not a great situation to be put in now again jacob's not a kid he's 40 years old at this point he's not a child but still it's a terrible situation at any age to be placed in so most of the kids when i ask him this question and maybe even in your mind is that jacob says no i don't want to trick my dad that's not right i don't want to do it now he kind of says that, but he doesn't really say that. 
Jacob answered his mother, Rebecca, but my brother Esau is hairy man, and I am smooth skinned. If my father touches me, I shall appear to him as a trickster and bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, your curse, my son, be upon me. Just do as I say and go fetch them for me. So rather than saying, no, I don't want to trick my dad. Jacob has already gone a level beyond that, which is, but what about the consequences of this? Okay, if I'm willing to do this, which he seems to be willing to do it right away, there's no, yeah, mom, I don't think I should do that. He says, it's not going to work. <laughs> it's not going to work. And when it doesn't work, there are consequences to this, mom. So he at least is thinking about the consequences. So again, maybe he knows, and we already know he tricked his, or, or didn't trick his his brother, but but made his brother give him the birthright, the inheritance, double portion of inheritance. But now he seems to be, now he seems to think that this is tricking. He didn't think, or maybe he didn't care that he was tricking his brother, or he didn't think it was tricking. But in this case, there's no question that he's going to be tricking his dad. And that his dad will curse him instead of blessing him. And that's what he says. My blessing will turn into a curse. So that's what he says. There will be a consequence to it. So at least Jacob seems to have an understanding of consequences. Even if he's willing to do this, which is, you know, not a nice thing to do to your dad. He does understand that it will bring consequences. And so Rebecca's answer is not, this is what God wants us to do. That could have been her answer. I'm only following what God told me when you were in utero. That's not what she says. She says, if there's a problem, it'll be on me. Just do what I told you to do. And she reiterates that phrase. Do what I tell you to do. Do as I say. Shema Bikoli. Shema Bikoli. Listen to my voice. You know, it's also, if I was, you know, if, if, if I was Rebecca and I had heard um, Isaac saying that to Esau and knew that he intended to ex exclude Jacob from the blessing, I would, I would feel like that wasn't fair either. Um, I wouldn't think it was right that he had made this thing and was going to give his innermost blessing to only one child. Listen, I'm glad you articulated that. That's the traditional answer or a, tr a traditional answer. Hold on that. And now let's look at it carefully today because it's very important. Sarah just articulated because that's the plain understanding of this, which is that Rebecca is doing God's work. So he got them and brought them to his mother and his mother prepared a dish as his father liked. Rebecca then took the best clothes of her older son, Esau, which were there in the house and had her younger son, Jacob, put them on. And she covered his hands and the hairless part of his neck with the skins of the kids, right? And she put in the hands of her son, Jacob, the dish and the bread that she had prepared. So as we know, she makes the dish and then she also makes sure that he appears to look or feel like not so much even look feel and smell like his brother because what she knows is that her husband can't see well but the assumption is he can smell and he can feel he can also taste because look all those senses are being used here in the story right all of those senses are at play. Listening, we'll see. Hearing. All the senses are at play. Because the ones that we normally rely on, our sense of sight and the, our sense of hearing, here in this story, they're taken away. Or at least they're marginalized. And so instead we rely on the sense of touch, the sense of smell, and the sense of taste. So this experience that we have right here, all of those senses are going to be used. And watch how each one of them is elicited in this, in this paragraph, in this chapter. 
So she has him put on the clothes, not so that he'll feel like him, because assumedly the clothes are probably similar. The skin feels differently, right? Because Esau's hairier, and we know that. Jacob raises that as an issue right away. But she actually did something even more clever by putting on the clothes, because the clothes are going to give him the odor of his brother, Esau. So it's not because he's going to look like him. Assumingly, why does it matter? Jake, you know, Jacob and Esau um, would look almost the same to the father who can't see right now. So it's really more of the matter of smell. Then she put in the hands, as we said, the dish, and he went to his father and he said, Father! And he said, yes, which of my sons are you? And unfortunately here, my friends, he have another he nanny. Vayomer Avi. And he said, father, the back and forth between father and son. Father, my father. It's not even father. It should be translated as my, my father. Avi, my father. I want to see if if uh, Friedman translates it as my father. Um, um, let me see if he says he says that. Yep, and he said my father, and he's and he translates it as, as I'm here. I'm here. Here you don't even get that. You get yes. Hinani here is translated as yes. So Isaac says Hineni to Jacob, thinking that it's, he thinks it's Esau, but he says to him right away, Hineni, mi atabini, who are you, my son? And that's why that translation, again, is not quite maybe the way that we like it here, because he says, who are you, my son? That is the way Friedman translated. Who are you, my son? Who are you, my son? Which has a much more powerful, much deeper, more resonating meaning to it than simply, which of my sons are you? It Which is like um, he was, he, he expected that he would be tricked. Maybe, maybe he's asking that deeper question to, Jacob right now. Who are you? Who are you, my son? Who are you? And now he says to him, Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Pray sit up and eat of my game that you give me, you may give me your innermost blessing, which is what he actually kind of said in the first place, which is not the approval of God, but the innermost blessing. So he went back to the innermost blessing um, phrase. But he says to his father, sit up, kumna, please sit up and eat of my game, which it wasn't game. Now, like some people traditionally try to say that Jacob doesn't really lie to his father. He says, to, and again, it all depends on where you put the punctuation because the Hebrew doesn't have punctuation. So the traditional reading that kind of gets Jacob off the hook, which I don't really think it does, is that he says to him, Jacob says to his father, it is me, Anochi, it is me. Esau is your firstborn. So not I am Esau, but I am Anochi. It's me. Esau is your firstborn. Now, that's not the way the intention of the punctuation is, but that was one of the ways the rabbis got him off the hook because you really, because the rest of the sentence gives it away that he's tricking him. I have done as you told me. No, that's, you didn't tell, he didn't tell you anything. So that's a lie. And then he says, eat of my game. He doesn't say eat of the goats that I slaughtered in the backyard. He says, eat of the game which implies that I went out and hunted this. So no matter what, you can't get him off the hook for lying because he seems to lie to his father in that critical moment. Mm -hmm. He goes along with it because uh, his father told him nothing. 
because he says a lie. He says to me that you, not that you, what you said, but what you said to me. Uh, you know, I mean, the other thing, um, I, will, I will, I will tell you that sometimes we put the comma there and they say, th this is also part of the whitewashing of this. As you have said, a lie kumna. If you put a comma there and say, uh, uh, sit up for me, dad, which is a, the a lie is not as you have said to me, but the a lie is part of kumna, you know, but, but he still, no matter what, if the worst, you know, if, if, if the least part of the lie is actually that he says that he brought game in, he did lie no matter what. But again, some people really don't like the fact that Jacob lies. I, I, I think it's pretty apparent that he lies and it's pretty apparent that he knows he's going to lie because he says that to his mother in the first place. I'm going to appear as a trickster. So he knows what he's doing. He knows what's at stake with what he's doing. But the rabbis really have a problem with the fact that Jacob lies. They don't like well, it. They, they don't like it. The other thing, too, is that game. Um, so these the kids, right, these goats, I imagine that they raise these goats, right? They're not hunting goat. They're raising the goats. They have these two goats. So whatever this game is, whatever this meat is that he is that Esau is supposedly getting him, it's not goat. And correct. So, correct. And the difference yeah. between the meat, it doesn't taste the difference between goat meat and like, you know, boar meat. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, no matter what, even if it's wild kosher animal, right? Even if it's a wild antelope, it, it's not game. And the word that he uses here is meat say d you know the my game and it's not my meat because if he had said my meat then maybe you could argue he didn't really lie but he he's kind of the other way to read this and the way that seems to be the straightforward way is he lies all along he's lying this whole line is a lie i did what you told me to do i got you the food i'm your firstborn i am asa all those things are lies i just mean does does isaac know can Isaac taste that it's not the meat that his that Esau would have brought him? It's not even it. He, Isaac is already two steps ahead. Because look at what Isaac said. Isaac said to his son, "How did you succeed so quickly, my son?" Because he knows there's no way that Isaac, there's no way that Esau would have been able to come back that fast hunting. He couldn't do it. The whole thing is predicated on the fact that he's out long enough for the mom and the son to trick him, which is that we can go in the backyard, take some meat and get it while he's still out hunting. But Isaac knows that Isaac knows that there's no way he could have gone, come back so quickly. So he right away is suspicious. He doesn't even have to have the smelling and the touching and the, all that stuff. It's already just by virtue of what happened. Isaac doesn't believe it. So Isaac first uses his mind and says, what, what's going on here? This isn't, there's no way. And, and, and Jacob's answer is perhaps the worst and the biggest lie that he says. I would argue this is the worst lie. The other lies are bad because, you know, he, he, he lies to his dad. But this next lie is terrible. He said, because the Lord, your God, granted me good fortune. So he actually invokes God in his, in his ruse. And people forget that. Like, I don't understand how you can get Jacob off the hook. Because Jacob now just said, God helped me in my, in my hunting. It's insane. He didn't have to say that. He could, he could have simply said, I got lucky, Dad. I got, I got, go, I got the, I got it on the first shot. I went out, and that was just right there. The, the, the animal was right there in front of me, I, and I hardly had to go anywhere. But he actually says, "God gave me a. It was like a miracle. God gave me a miracle. I mean, that's the worst." And he, and of course, he says, "Your God." He doesn't say, "My God." He says, "Your God," which also seems to indicate, to me at least, in my reading of this. And we don't have any indication yet, which again, the traditional scholars don't like to say, Jacob doesn't seem to have any clue that he's actually living in God's presence. And we might even see that today if we get to that part. But it doesn't seem like Jacob understands that he's supposed to do better. But it does. How badly must he want this blessing that he's willing to deceive his father like this? 
look, it's everybody, pe- Sarah, people have tried to get Jacob off the hook for this I, I mean, I, for a I don't long time. Get him off but, the but, hook. but 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 but, but the problem is doing, but. The problem is, is that he's now gone a step beyond because every lie that he's told thus far was invoked in his mother's name. His mother told him to do everything that he's done up until now, until now. I mean, Rabbi, you, Rabbi I, yeah. I could make a case that maybe this, maybe this actually is not a lie that he really isn't responding to that question. That's a good but, one. That's that he really has been granted good fortune, and that was when he was in the womb. That that's that is a traditional answer, and it definitely is a possibility that he's not responding to, uh, not responding to that. I, I, I look, it's a great other understanding, and thank you for for saying that because it really is. It's it's a great it's a great and way of read, and it's a traditional way of reading it. What you've just said is a traditional way of reading it. There's another thing that we haven't even discussed and that these are lessons for humanity. And I think they are saying to humanity, people lie, people deceive, and how do we handle it? Because even here over and over again, there are opportunities to get caught, but the lesson doesn't want this caught now. And it, it is a lesson for us. So what is the lesson for humanity that this happens and then how do we deal with it? Absolutely. But, and yeah. also though, yeah. I'm not trying to excuse him from lying. I'm just saying that that this is the, this, this is the, what he's willing to do to get this blessing. This is how badly he wants this blessing from his father is that he's willing to deceive him to this degree. I mean, if you think about like getting dressed up and pretending to be your brother and, and going through this motion of, of lying to your father, and I think what could possibly motivate you to do something, it would have to be that that desire for the blessing was so much more. You wanted that blessing so much that you were willing to do that. Um, yes, it speaks to that which again you could also read as he wants that which is the innermost blessing of his father also could be um it could also be that um he just wants to take everything from his brother that's another possibility too which is not a good possibility which is that you know this is just about taking everything from his brother it, he, he, he doesn't like his brother he doesn't want his brother to have anything and he wants his brother to have nothing now again you could be right it could be he just really wants that blessing but it could also be you know what i don't like my brother my brother has been on my case my whole life he's thought he's been stronger than me he's tougher than me he's already married he already is you know starting a family you know and and we're and the worst part is we're twins and he's strong and dad always liked him more but he you know what? I'm going to take, I'm going to take every, I'm going to take everything from him. I'm going to take everything from this guy. So again, you're right. It could be that he just wants the really holy thing, but it could also be, I just want everything. And, and I'm telling you the reason I'm, the reason I read this is because I've seen this happen. I've seen people that are, that are so bitter towards their siblings that it, that, that it's not that their siblings got something. They wanted them to get nothing. So if their sibling got something They'll take it, they'll hide it, they'll break it, they'll say it's not there. They literally don't want that sibling because maybe they think that sibling didn't take care of dad or whatever, whatever it is, whatever their justification for it is, they don't want that, they don't want that sibling to have anything. They say, Oh, everything was easy for you. It always came so easily for you. You got everything. I got nothing. There's nothing for me, and I'm gonna take this. Yep. And it's not only taking this, it's taking everything. I don't want that. I don't want my brother to walk away with anything. And I've seen it happen. So I'm only telling you, it can be read that way too. And again, I see that's, that. not a good, that's not a good way of reading Jacob. But again, the last thing I will say about it, and I mentioned it, but I want to mention it again, is that he doesn't invoke God as his God. He invokes God as your God. And that's always stuck with me as a little bit, is a little bit of Jacob not being in the right place yet. And it kind of goes with the the part that we'll either read at the end today or what we'll read next week, which is when, like, does Jacob really even have a sense when he says those words, you know, I'm in the presence of God. Did he, did he ever feel that up until that point? 
because so far all he's doing is following what we know is he's following his mother's wishes. All I will say, which I didn't say yet, and you may have already thought about this, we are talking about our ancestor here. Every Jew, whatever tribe, whether they're a Levite, an Israelite, a Judite, a whatever they were, Samaritan, a, a, a Judean, whoever they were for the last 3,000 years, every, every Israelite, every Hebrew that connects to Adonai is a descendant of Jacob. And here we have our ancestor perhaps painted in a not very good light in the Bible itself. And there is something very special about understanding that when we see our ancestors in a complex way in their humanity, that we shouldn't try to whitewash. We, should, we don't have to have them be perfect because they develop. And remember, there are consequences that happen in the Bible. And we know that Jacob is going to be tricked by his father-in-law. And we know that he's going to be tricked by his sons. So there is a karmic payback for what he does here. And if he doesn't trick them, then it makes, if he doesn't trick his father as bad as we think, then maybe the Bible, maybe you're, you know, we're kind of missing the full context of Jacob's life and the understanding that, you know, when we live like this, there are consequences. Yes. And so... Yeah. We and will we cannot expect perfection. Yes. And I will show you though, there was one thing and, and Sarah alluded to, and I think actually, as I said, may touch on it from the standpoint of is it a different author? But there does seem to be Isaac. Isaac seems to be complicit in this, or maybe even there's another version of this story or two versions of the story where in one version Isaac has no issue giving the blessing to him in the first place. And this whole story is one author telling us something about Jacob that the other author doesn't say. Just keep that in mind. And I will get to that. So Isaac said to Jacob, come closer that I may fill you, my son, whether or whether you're really my son, Asla, or not. Or Emo. And he says that. So he still at this point seems to have a lot of doubt whether that is the case. And his first, his first sense that he's going to engage after using his mind, because he actually uses his mind, he, he logically says, this, is, this couldn't happen so fast, is he's going to use the sense of, of feel, this touch, touch. Every time I read this story, I, um, Isaac is my grandfather. I always see it as um, Isaac is my grandfather, who, whose Hebrew name was Isaac. But in my mind, it's, I imagine my grandfather as Isaac. I don't know why. So Jacob drew close to his father, Isaac. Because, felt... I, because your grandfather was blind. Yeah, probably because he was blind. You, yeah, you left out that important. I, yeah. I, I knew what she was getting at. <laughs> but think about this moment. He draws close to his father who felt him and wondered. The voice is the voice of Jacob, yet the hands are the hands of Esau. So there's a disconnect here. There's a dissonance between what he feels and what he hears and so his sense of hearing his ears tell him it's not it's not jacob it's esau but the feel now feels like because of what rebecca did it feels like esau so he's he's he doesn't think it's him but he's now his senses are telling him his two senses are telling him different things and so again he asks him are you really my son esau and he said, I am, Ani, Vayomer Ani. Now, some people say, well, he doesn't really say, I'm Esau. He says, I am. And he doesn't say, Ani, Esau. Maybe, perhaps. But he's given another opportunity here to maybe come out of this ruse, this lie, this trick, and he doesn't do it. He said, serve me and let me eat some of my son's game that I may give you my innermost blessing. So he served him and he ate. And he brought him wine and he drank. So now he's engaging his taste, his sense of taste. And he says, let me eat some of my son's game. He doesn't, by the way, say your game, which right. is interesting, which seems right. to indicate that maybe he knows it's not, it's not him. But again, he's going along with this. And he eats it. And he also drinks. 
And then his father, Isaac, said to him, come close and kiss me, my son. Wow. And he went up and kissed him and he smelled his clothes and he blessed him saying, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of the fields that the Lord has blessed. And so that last sense, right, is the sense of smell, which throws it over the edge. So it's very interesting what happens here. He doesn't have really a sense of, of sight, so that's out. So he has a sense of touch. Touch tells him it's, it's Esau. The, his hearing tells him it's, it's Jacob. His taste, I guess, tells him that it, it's Esau because it's what he like. And then the final thing is he smells him. And that's what clinches it because that's what makes him smell. The clothes that he was wearing makes him smell like, or maybe the smell of the animals. The animals can, made him smell, and that's what made him think. And again, you could also argue that it's also his logic, his mind from what you know what had happened in the first place, which is how did he come back so quick? So his mind and his hearing is telling him it's Jacob, but those other senses, those other senses taste touch and smell are telling him no i guess it's i guess it's asa so what does he do may god give you of the dew of heaven and the fat of the earth abundance of new grain and wine let the people serve you and nations bow to you be master over your brothers and let your mother's sons bow to you cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. That is the blessing. There it is. May you have abundance of food and may you be wealthy and you know good stuff come to you as far as that. May you have the nations serve you. You're going to be master over your brothers, which by the way, where are the other brothers? Because we only know of Jacob and Esau. Were there other brothers running around here? We don't know of them. Uh, but is this the blessing that Abraham kind of passed on? I don't know. We don't really, don't really know what's going on here in the, in that there's other brothers that seem to be, there's a plural. Um, but is this the blessing? You know, is this the blessing, the innermost blessing? Well, it seems that's the case. Well, that's the blessing. No sooner had Jacob left the presence of his father, Isaac, after Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, then his brother Esau came back in from his hunt. Now, there's no thank you, dad, for giving me your innermost blessing. That's it. Go back out at Esau and, you know, go back out and, you know, goodbye. And there's no kiss. There's nothing beyond that because the next words are no sooner had he left than Esau came back from his hunt. So he leaves and it says again, Right when he leaves, that's when Isaac, uh, when uh, Esau comes back. So, but he still has to prepare the food. He too prepared a dish and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father sit up. Just, you know, almost the same words. Yakum, Yakum Avi. Let my father sit up and eat of his son's game so that you may give me your innermost blessing. I will say that the way that Jacob said it when he was pretending to be Esau it was a little bit nicer than the way, than the way, uh, than the way it's not really let it's just get up, dad. Yakum yeah, is not kumna is not please now or here now, you know, sit up, please. You know, maybe by the way, that's what gave it away that, that it was Jacob because Jacob talked in a different way than Esau did. Esau pretty much says, get up, dad. I brought you, I brought you the, the game. And again, so you can give him your innermost blessing. So he's down, he gets right down to business. If you notice, when Jacob comes in and uh, when he comes in, he says uh, to them to give me your innermost blessing. He says that, but he says the words kumna, shava vachal, you know, pray, sit up. That they translated as pray, sit up, kumna please whatever a little different but it's pretty close so 
what happens now to Isaac? His father, Isaac, said to him, who are you? And he said, I'm your son, Esau, your firstborn. Isaac was seized with a very violent trembling. Who was it then, he demanded, that hunted game and brought it to me? Moreover, I ate of it before you came, and I blessed him. Now he must remain blessed. Now, it says that he was trembling, which seems to me, and seems to, again, flat out, that he is very, and it says, a violent trembling. So it doesn't seem like he's acting. It doesn't seem like he's acting, but it seems fairly rhetorical that he says, who was it then? Who was it then? Mm-hmm. And before he can even oh. be challenged, he says, but I blessed him and he must be remain blessed. He says that. That's the way it is. I blessed him. So he actually cuts off right, right away. Isaac, any challenge to what happened? He says right away, whatever I did, that's it. It's been done. When Esau heard his father's word, he burst into a wild and bitter sobbing. And he said to his father, bless me too, father. Gamani, please, me too. So he seems to be pretty upset about it. It's such a sad scene. So Esau, and again, we normally paint Esau as a violent, uncaring, uncouth, crass person. But he seems very upset that he doesn't get his father's blessing. And he says, bless me too. So it's a terrible scene. Hmm. But he answered, your brother came with guile and took away your blessing. And so he tells him, I got tricked. I got tricked. And Esau said, was he then named Jacob that he might supplant me these two times? First, he took away my birthright, and now he's taken away my blessing. And he added, have you not reserved a blessing for me? And so this gets back to Jacob's name, which is the heel. The guy who grabbed the heel. Now, the word heel is also the word for the bottom of your foot. And it's funny because in our language, too, a heel is somebody who's not necessarily a trickster, but not a good person. That person's a heel. You say that, right? Here in Hebrew, it seems to have more of a connotation of the person who grabs something, who supplants it, who takes it away, who tricks all of those words steps on you could be could we could use that analogy because we use that for stepping but yes yeah, somebody who has in this case the definitely the tricking is there i wonder whether again turning to uh, friedman's translation um let me see if uh friedman goes uh, was his name really called Jacob, which is kind of, again, was he then called Jacob? Uh, and he's usurped me two times now. Same as supplant, usurped me. He's taken my birthright, and here now he's taken my blessing. So Esau makes a new play on the name Jacob, which was derived previously for the word heal. Now he derives it as the word to usurp or to catch, to grab. Now, Originally, again, the, 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 the Hebrew is attached to him grabbing the heel of his brother, which is why, you know, he's, as he's grabbing Esau's heel. But again, it seems as though this is going on. Now, there's another version of this kind of story with Judah's sons, um, Peretz and Zerach, where they literally, t- one takes the other one out of the running by by reaching him and grabbing him back and then putting himself in right there's a crimson cord that's tied around his arm we'll get to it in, in a few chapters but maybe there was a version of that story some people say that kind of was going on here too which is that this fighting that's going on was going on inside the womb maybe um, the original translation was to surplant because he he grabs his, his heel but intention is to to pull him back so he can go 
take his place. Place, yeah. Maybe again, it wasn't originally the, understood yes. a foot, a heel. And but, there is a theory that, that that's the actual original, the Peretz and Zerach story was actually the original Jacob and Esau story. Um, but it doesn't, the, the takeaway from this, of course, is that Esau is making the point that this is why he's named that, which, by the way, we're left with because that's our ancestor. And the usurper is what he calls him. And the Bible preserves that because it says Yaakov. Oh, you know, it's by Yaakovini, which he's, he's supplanted me. We're he's still Yaakov, today, he's but Yaakov me. That's <laughs> what he's done. He's Yaakov me. And we're still referred to today by people who support the Palestinians um, as the we're the, the um, you know, we've, we've taken their land. Yes. So. They get so look, this is a problem that people have that because the Bible itself gives us a picture of Jacob as somebody who's grabbed this away. Now, again, the takeaway, of course, is that he's doing God's will, like God set this up. On the other hand, you could say, well, why didn't God just have Jacob be born first and not have to have this? Well, again, one of the takeaways from the bible that we have in many places is that sometimes we have to take matters into our own hands and in this case rebecca and jacob did that now they're we'll, we'll, when we get to the end we'll 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 uh, review this because we have about nine more verses to this story and isaac answered to Esau, i i have made him master over you i've given him all his brothers for servants and sustained him with grain and wine. What then can I still do for you, my son? So again, it, it seems as though there's other brothers. I mean, we don't have any names for any of these other brothers, but again, you know, are there other children of concubines or something that aren't mentioned? I don't know. Bottom line is he's basically saying he's, in, he's the one in charge now. There's nothing I can do. And Esau said to his father, have you but one blessing, father? Bless me too, father. And he says again, Gamani, bless me too. And Esau wept aloud. So Esau is, is just, it's, he's crushed by this. He's crushed. And his father Isaac answered him, saying to him, See, your abode shall enjoy the fat of the earth and the dew of the heaven above. Yet by your sword you shall live. And you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restive, you shall break the, his yoke from your neck. And so this blessing, which is Esau's blessing, is that you will be okay. You'll have food. But you're going to live by the sword. And you will serve your brother. But there will come a time <laughs> when you will no longer have to serve him. What does restive mean? restive in is that there will be a time when you will be um well in this case restive really means uh it really means you know aggressive or you'll be strong enough um that you will you know have enough power you know you you know it usually means you know you're gonna be on the move that you're that you're shaking things up but here it really means you know you'll have enough power to break the yoke you know that you'll be you'll be able to um to uh to have to take power back um and i'm just going to tell you that his translation for this is uh it will be that when you get dominion you'll break his yoke and you'll you'll break his yoke from your neck when you get dominion so the mm -hmm. word restive is translated he translates it as dominion um which is you know you'll get you'll get enough power you'll get enough strength and then you'll you will be free from him which again most people think you know talks about the history of the edomites who eventually while they wind up serving israel for a long time during the time of king david they they're a, a vassal kingdom to the judeans eventually later on during the babylonian period they did free themselves from um 
the Judean control. And actually the Edomians, the Edomites, took part in the raiding of the temple. When the Babylonians came in, the Edomites came in after them and just picked the spoils or was left behind. And so Edomites are, are cursed for that. Uh, the prophet Obadiah, who some people say was an Edomite himself, actually uh, curses the Edomites for that. But again, they do come, there comes a time when the Edomites become powerful. What's interesting, as we, as we know, too, is one of the later, one of the last Edomian rulers is uh, King Herod's uh, grandfather. And the Edomians uh, are somewhat independent during the Greco-Roman period. But then one of the Maccabean kings, John Hyrcanus, conquers them, actually forces the Edomians to convert to Judaism, to actually worship in Jerusalem. And one of those Edomians, the descendants of the Edomians, is King Herod the Great. Mm-hmm. King Herod is a, his, you know, his family from Antipater, his, uh, his family, which was very Greco-Roman in nature, but they were Jewish. I mean, they worshiped in the temple and King Herod rebuilt the temple and mm-hmm. did a beautiful job of it because we still have it. It's the Western Wall and Um, the temple that he rebuilt was supposedly at a scale like it never had been built even back in Solomon's time, but he was an Edomian. He was an Edomite. So interestingly enough, much later on, the Edomians become um, powerful enough to essentially kind of take control. And actually the last Jewish Kings or King Herod's sons and grandsons and great grandsons, uh, his uh, family, the 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 Agrippas, Agrippa the first and Agrippa the second, that are part of the Herodian family, they are the last kings before the last Jewish kings. The last people that be, can be called Jewish kings are King Herod's descendants. Uh, and again, how Jewish were they? Depends who you ask. But the, maybe to the Romans they were Judean. Maybe to some of Jews they weren't really Judean. But uh, they seem to have worshipped uh, at least. In some ways, they kept kosher, or they they worshipped in Jerusalem, offered sacrifices. But uh, then the Edomians disappear, and and there are no we don't know who's an Edomian anymore. So there there, there are no Edomians anymore. Um, they became Arabs or Jews, and and they're lost in the sands of history, like the Canaanites and the and the Ammonites and the Philistines and all those other people. We don't know who they are. So that is the blessing of Asa. It's not a great blessing, but you can make the argument there's it's not there's hope, there's something, there's life. It's not all that different. It's not all that different. But there's another blessing coming. It says Asa harbored a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing which his father had given him. And Asa said to himself, Let but the morning period of my father come and I will kill my brother Jacob. Now, it says that Esau said that to himself. It says that, that's what it says, belly bow in his heart. However, however, however silently he said it, the words of her elder son Esau were reported to Rebecca. So somebody heard it because Rebecca heard it. And she sent for her son, younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. That's what she says. What is he doing? He is biding his time. And the only thing that's keeping him alive right now is the thought of killing you. Now, listen, my son, listen to me again. Listen to me. Shema Bikoli, same phrase she used before. Listen to my voice. Flee at once to Haran to my brother Levan. Stay with him a while until your brother's fury subsides until your brother's anger against you subsides. So the phrase is actually kind of used twice, but in slightly different ways, but it's really powerful. His fury against you subsides and your anger against you subsides. And then it says, and he forgets what you have done to him, which is a mind blowing issue. You know, it's like, okay, maybe he'll calm down one day, but is he ever going to forget it? <clears throat> is he ever going to forget it? And then, and she says, then I will fetch you from there. Let me not lose you both in one day. And that phrase is very powerful, very powerful, because she says, I don't want to lose both of you. 
Now, some people say this refers to the fact that Asa is never going to talk to her again. Asa is she's done, right? She can never have a relationship with Asa. That's one possibility. There's another possibility, which is that she's thinking about the consequences that if she does indeed, if he does indeed kill his brother, he's going to be killed because we assume that this is a death penalty type situation, that he's going to get killed too. So it may be not that um, it, she's like talking about this figuratively, but that she literally is saying both of them are going to die. Look, she takes it seriously. She knows Asa. She knows his reputation. She knows that he's a more violent guy. He's a hunter. He knows how to use a blade, so to speak. And remember, in the back of our minds, we know that the Genesis story began with a brother killing another brother. Mm -hmm. In the first family, we have a brother killing another brother. In the first family, we have Cain killing his brother, Abel. So is it possible? Yeah, it's 100% possible that she is thinking, I'm going to lose both of my sons. So she says, you got to get out of town and go to my brother, Levon. Now, at first, it doesn't say anything about get a wife there. I'm going to get you set up. We're going to everything doesn't say that she literally just says get out of town That's all she says and now the next line is rebecca said to isaac i am disgusted with my life because of the hittite women if jacob marries a hittite woman like these from among the native women what good will life be to me now this is a perfect time a perfect place for us to have her now come up, this very clever lady, this very clever lady just came up with a way to get her husband to buy into the fact that we're going to get him out. I'm going to show one thing to you now so that, <laughs> again, I said at the beginning, I was going to do this, so I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to replay something right now. So I'm going to take you back from verse 46, which we just read. We're going to go back to right here. The end of chapter 26. When Esau was 40 years old, he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beiri, the Hittite, and Basimoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. They were a source of bitterness to Isaac and Rebekah. And Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with my wife because of the Hittite woman. If Jacob marries a Hittite woman like these from among the native women, what good will life be to me? Does that line make a little bit more sense now? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm only telling you this because I believe the story makes a little bit more sense right now. Because that line probably came in the priestly author, the P author, right after that. Right after mm -hmm. that. Because she says, like these. Now, that word alone, ke'ele, like these, kind of tells us, oh, yeah, 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 the Hittite women. But if it's the previous line, there's no, oh, yeah, that's right. We were talking about Hittite women. Right. So it's very possible, folks, that in the priestly version of this story, there never is a version of Jacob stealing the blessing. Mm. There very likely was a version in our history in some traditions that Jacob never did that. Jacob never stole anything. So the concept, and again, the J author that we probably is, again, the, the author that just wrote the previous 45 verses is a very complex and very beautiful and poetic and descriptive author who has beautiful prayers and beautiful lines and beautiful dialogue and beautiful emotions and complex, complex dialogue and complex emotions. P, P doesn't tell stories very well, but P has an issue and an agenda. 
And it maybe was never in his agenda and never in his wildest imagination that he has to justify anything of what Jacob just previously did. Now, again, it doesn't matter because that's not the version of the story that we have. The Bible presents it this way. And it is so beautifully edited together that you can read it and mm -hmm. never notice it. But I will tell you, when people try to say, well, how does the two stories, how does that, that why? It, because it's, there's two stories. And mm -hmm. this story of him getting a wife is a story of why Jacob goes to Aram in the first place, where in the other version, he goes there to get his, to get away from his brother who's going to kill him. Now, again, to get today, we have both of those reasons. He kills two birds with one stone, he gets out of town and he gets an, and he's going to get a wife. But according to this, and again, it's beautiful the way the stories were edited together. They were woven together beautifully, but I will tell you, it also makes sense with what we're about to read a lot more, I believe. So Isaac sent for Jacob and blessed him. He instructed him saying, you shall not take a wife among the Canaanite women. Go up to Padan Aram to the house of Bethuel, your father, your mother's father, your, your grandfather, and take a wife from there among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So go get married. And this is what he says to him. May El Shaddai bless you, make you fertile and numerous, so that you become an assembly of peoples. May he grant the blessing of Abraham to you and your offspring, that you may possess the land where you are sojourning, which God assigned to Abraham. Now, mm -hmm. that's a whole nother blessing, my friends. Okay? That's a whole nother blessing. And arguably, again, maybe it's not as beautiful as may the dew of the earth and the, okay, maybe it's not as poetic, but it's actually really much more effective than that blessing because this blessing tells him maybe the most important part, which is definitely the most important part to many of us. And it's definitely more important to That's what happened. whoever wrote this. Yes. And that the land that you're living in is yours. It's not Asaw's. It's not anybody else's. It's not Ishmael's. It's not anybody. It's your family's blessing from Abraham to me, to you. The land that you are in is your land. It was given to God by God to Abraham and given to me. And now I'm giving it to you. Is this, is that's this the blessing. Time, is this the first time we've heard the term El Shaddai? No, no. It yeah. happens with Abraham on the... Um, yeah. And he does the blessing between the pieces on the uh, yep. mountaintop. Okay. It's also okay. part of the blessing that Melchi Tzedek offers him when he comes back with Lot. The blessing, and that's weird because it's actually a pagan guy giving him the blessing. But, but what's so wild about this is that this is maybe the blessing that was intended in the first place. So look, traditionally, what we kind of are left with is that maybe this is the blessing. The, there's a possibility that, the, that this author doesn't even know about the other story and doesn't care about the other story. Right. There's another possibility, which is one of the traditional understandings. It's a little bit harder to buy, but we can buy it. It's the one that we have to kind of take if we're going to say it's all written by one person, which is that Isaac wanted to give this blessing in the first place. That's the, one of the understandings is that Rebecca just jumped the gun. Rebecca never had to do what she had to do. She took it on herself to do it because this blessing was always in Jacob, it was always in Isaac's back pocket to give to Jacob, which is the real blessing. The real blessing is that you're going to get the land. It, you're going to be a, numerous. It's a hell of a blessing to give to a son who just, who just can, um, you know, uh, tricked you. you I, Correct. And so that's really the, why I said it makes more sense if it's a different author. Because yeah. if that isn't the case, then we have a horrible problem, which is that Esau either woke up and finally does see the light, if you will. By the way, no, nowhere here, by the way, is he blind. But maybe again, and this is one of the traditional understandings, is that God gave him his inner sight back or his sight back. He finally sees what's really going on. So that's a traditional possibility. But it basically, that's what has to happen. That, that's what has to happen. Because where's, where, if this is the first time that Isaac and, and 
Jacob have seen each other since the trick. Where is, hey, son, why did you trick me before? Where's the, hey, by the way, you didn't have to trick me. I'm giving you the blessing anyways. Or I know your mom made you, try, your mom came and told me what happened. None of that's here. So either they, he just forgot or he didn't care or he saw the light and realizes that this is what he should have done all along or he always intended to do this and he went along with it. And that's one of the traditional understandings is that he knew all along what was really going on, that that blessing was not really the real blessing. This is the real blessing. And that's been one of the traditional understandings is that this is the real blessing, the blessing that is the blessing of Abraham. This is the blessing that he's been holding on to. And it's the one where he invokes Abraham. It's the one where he says, this is our family blessing. And it's the blessing right. that one day Jacob will give to his own grandsons. Is this he doesn't, he gives blessings to his sons, but he gives this blessing to his grandsons, to Ephraim and Menashe. Well, this, is this blessing is the birthright though. Is, isn't that doesn't that feel like that's more of the 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 birthright blessing well Maybe. if you understand the the birthright is really not property but the land then yes that this is the real birthright this is the birthright as the land of israel but it definitely seems to be the one that actually if you think about it invokes god's blessing and and, the, and not just god's right. blessing but abraham that this is the blessing of our family yeah and that's why this blessing is so powerful. And again, I'm willing to concede it's not as poetic, it's not as beautiful, but it's really the it's really the blessing. It's the real blessing. And was was Isaac always ready to give this blessing? Or again, is this the blessing that he sends his son away for with when he leaves? And he tells him essentially, this is the blessing that's going to make you a great man. And it's going to have you come back. I'll tell you what, though, if 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 the the story of his trickery didn't exist, the struggle with the angel on his way back wouldn't make sense either. Well, the the I, as I said, the whole context, right, of 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 Laban tricking him because there's a there's a wonderful midrash that when when you know that when he confronts his father in law about being tricked, you know the actually his you know it comes from rachel which is what are you talking about you tricked your dad and when his own sons trick him then there's you know, again there's no karmic payback if 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 he didn't but again all those stories are, are those are all stories those are all stories from jay and so those stories can all exist simultaneously right. as as well, and no matter what they exist simultaneously Wait, wait, a couple of people are talking the same time. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, no. Historically, this makes more sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, and the priestly author is not, I mean, this text, whatever you want to call it, this text isn't concerned with the, it's not really concerned with the Mishigas of the family, right? It actually cuts to the chase, which is, you're going to be a, a great nation. Yes. And your nation is going to have a national homeland, which is the land of Israel. I think um, I think that Jay must have written the the story of when he returns, um, it, when he struggles with the angel and returns to his brother. Oh yeah, um, as well. I mean, it, it, yeah, it yeah. only makes sense that Jay would have written that too. I mean, look, I, I, I will, just, I will tell you this: book. any any good story with good characters, with with like deep meaning and philosophical meaning and and di like i said dialogue is pretty much a j story in in genesis and by the way again in other parts of 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 exodus those stories of the dialogues going back and forth, the dialogue and going back and forth those are j stories i mean they're they're very easy to spot mm -hmm. but again what we're left with is is this and and again there's no there's no, Jacob doesn't say anything here. You know, there's no, there's no response. Mm -hmm. Jacob, Jacob doesn't say, Oh, thank you dad for the blessing. You know, J, 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 there's no, he calls him and says, yes, I'm here. I mean, look, you have an author, you have a writer who has such rich use 
of language that when he says the word hineni, he takes us back to Abraham and he takes us back to, you know, he, he takes us through the Bible with this one word. You yeah. just have that in other places. So yeah, we have to have those stories because again, that's really the, 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 the meat, you know, uh, if you will, that's the, and that, those are the stories, the narrative that actually teaches us the lessons, but to actually move the story forward, we really need to have this. And again, you know, is it, is it beautiful descriptive? No, but it cuts to the chase and it gives us the understanding that this is what you got to do. You get down to business, you go get a wife, you do, you go where I tell you to go. And this is going to, you're going to be blessed. And it's going it, it, to, this is, this is what God wants. This is what God wants. And the blessings come from down through Abraham, Isaac to Jacob. And, yep. and it, it makes sense. And, and then yep. history follows. You know, what's really sad though, is this is the last time Jacob will ever see his mother. Yep. He never sees her again. Yep. Um, uh, this is, you know, this is part of, um, in our, in our lives, uh, we experience some things like, like, uh, the, the version and the main story that we remember of, of the, of the trick. Um, and we remember the story. We replay the story in our minds. And uh, quite frankly, hopefully, we learn from the, the stories that, that are, are, are not easy. That story is not an easy story. Uh, and it's one that gave our, our sages, as I said, a real problem because it does not depict Jacob in a positive way. And again, if you make the argument, yeah, but there's more to come and Jacob's going to learn from his lessons and Jacob's going to there's going to be a payback for it. Jacob doesn't get off the hook, but, but, um, but, and so we need that. We need to have those stories the way they are, which is the memorable, that they're memorable, that they, that they're deep and they're, they're rich and that they're, that yeah. they're, 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 they're human. But, um, but again, that's not the concern here, which is the priestly author and again it makes complete sense and i don't want to dwell on it but if you're a priest and you care about lineage you care about your descendants because priests had to be descended from one priest to the next who your father was was very important for the priest this is this is the the issue of don't marry the canaanites you know the j author doesn't really have that judgment about about the canaanite uh and and foreign women if you will um there are Canaanite women, and arguably we're going to read about one in a few weeks, uh, Tamar, who's heroic in her own right. And we really don't have a judgment in there in the fact that she's a Canaanite woman, um, um, as a matter of fact, by the way. So there are some, some substantial differences in, in the ethos and in the kind of the, the, uh, the ideology as far as uh, what makes a, what makes a, Hebrew, if you will. Um, but again, the, both of them are, are obviously necessary for us. And uh, But again, I only point, and I point it out, as you know, very rarely, there's other places where it's not important and it's not, it doesn't, it's not crucial. But I think in this case, it actually helps us understand the story a little differently that there's a, there's just a different agenda. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to finish with this part. As I said, we're actually going to read a little bit more, but as I said, most of it is the blessing, but as I said, there's really three blessings. There's, there's the blessing to the stolen blessing. There's the blessing that Esau gets. And then there's the blessing that Jacob gets after that. So there's really three blessings that we, that we read. Um, and I really like to remind people that there's three blessings, because if you only talked about the two stolen blessing or the stolen blessing and the response to the stolen blessing, then you miss an important point, which is that Jacob got a blessing from his father. That was not a trick. Isaac knew exactly who he was blessing in that moment. There's no trick. There's no Jacob's a trickster. Jews are tricksters. Jews don't have a, a right to the land. They're tricked. They tricked their father out of the land, whatever they tricked their brother out of the land. No. In the Bible, let me make it very clear, in what we just read, the blessing in full knowledge that he calls Jacob to him and blessed him. 
And that's what it says. There's no question about it. And it's very important for people to know that. And that's why I take a moment to focus on it and not just say, well, he blesses them. No, it's, he knows he's blessing them. And then it says, Jacob, uh, then Isaac sent Jacob off and he went to Padan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, mother of Jacob and Esau. And when Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him off to Padan Aram to take a wife from there, charging him as he blessed him, you shall not take a wife among the Canaanite women, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and gone to Badan Aram. Esau realized that Canaanite women displeased his father Isaac. <laughs> so, so, Good morning. So he actually, he actually <laughs> notices, he actually sees in, the, in this priest, the author or whatever, this version. So Esau went to Ishmael and took two wife in addition to the wives he had, Mahalat, the daughter of Ishmael, the son of Abraham, uh, son of Abraham, sister of Nebaot. Um, and it says that he took a wife from the Ishmaelites, from Ishmael's family, right? From Ishmael's daughter. So he marries into the family, which again, make the argument, it's even closer than Rebecca's family or his mom's family, because they're from they're from Aram. They're from they're the sons of they're 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 from Bethuel, they're from Nahor. Ishmael is Abraham's own people, right? So he's actually marrying, he's actually marrying his um his cousin, Mahalat is his cousin through Ishmael, through his half uncle, if you will, his half uncle Ishmael. Um, so she's from actually the Abraham, the Abraham side. So she's very close. Actually, again, well, I mean, Rebecca, Rebecca's niece is 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 Rachel. So that's, you know, she's a Hebrew once she's married to Isaac. But anyways, the point is he marries a legitimate Abrahamic person in, mm -hmm. in, in marrying Mahalat. So she, so he, he does the right thing. He marries a woman that is going to make his parents happy. Now, again, it's interesting that uh, it's interesting that in, in this version too, that he says it displeased his father, Isaac. He doesn't mm -hmm. seem to care so much that it displeases his mother so so <laughs> it does say that it, and again it's not like he doesn't recognize that the story says that he obeyed his father and mother it doesn't really seem to matter to Esau who has really only cared about what his father says and that's what it says it does in Isaac his father so it doesn't say he cares what Rebecca said now again if we're under the understanding that he really doesn't care much for his mom and maybe cares for his mom much less after what had just happened, then that makes complete sense that he's concerned with what his father thinks about him. But, uh, but did anyone make it explicit to him before? So it's, you know, it's a little, it's a little bit of that. Again, did the parents make it clear to him or was there this, you know, well, we didn't really say flat out that he should, you know, that you shouldn't do this, but you should have, you should have, we, we've said it before and, you know, and, or we've made it clear. We don't like these Canaanite people. Isaac has already had a bad experience with them stealing his wells. So, you know, you can make the argument they've seen the behavior and uh, did they get them? Did, did, did Esau get the message that he's not supposed to be marrying these people? I mean, maybe, they needed to make it explicit to him. Maybe they needed to tell him not to, because he does respond once he sees what happens. Um, and it seems as though, again, it's it's his father's reaction that he's concerned about. That it also that it also bothers his father. Uh, <laughs> and it is it is his father who says to Jacob, "You shall not take a wife from among the Canaanite women." Um, which is, which again is weird because, you know, did they, it doesn't say fully why it displeased Rebecca at the beginning, but we know Rebecca is really, really upset. It says that Rebecca is upset about it and she's told, she, she doesn't like it. So 
you know, look, some people have speculated that it's because what really got Rebecca mad, I mean, maybe Rebecca didn't like it in the first place, but what really gets her mad is that she sees how they act. So she might have been prejudiced, if you will, before, maybe, but what really gets her is the fact that she sees that her daughter-in-law's don't have the values that she wants them to, that she wants to have in her family so it could be that it's more than just that and again maybe that's what finally gets jacob to say you're not going to make the same mistake that your brother made right now he does respond to it though he doesn't just say well too bad <laughs> too late he actually tries to tries to uh do the right thing if you will for his parents but you can make the argument whatever happened to his family now by this point those kids are being raised in a in a canaanite home mm -hmm. and uh you know do those things happen yeah absolutely mm -hmm. uh does it happen that you know people have said ah, i'd rather not have my family marry out but they marry out and then once they marry out and the spouse turns out to be a you know a schnook that the people say, yeah, this is what I always was worried about. You better not marry somebody else. Yeah, that happens. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's a weird dynamic when it happens, but it does happen. And I will tell you that it's, it's not necessarily always fair, right? Uh, and that, um, you know, just because one person marries somebody that the parents don't like, that they make these assumptions about everybody else. But, um, but we know that it's an issue. It was an issue for Abraham because we read just two weeks ago that, you know, Abraham goes through this in, you know, elaborate expense and ritual to get his son to marry a woman from, from Aram in the first place, that Rebecca herself was brought for that very reason. So Rebecca knows that what the family, you know, what the family's values are and what the value, what the family's desire was because she is a reflection of that her very presence in the family of abraham is a testament to the fact that eliezer went up and and brought her back from aram right so she knows at great expense at great expense and yeah and that and that she herself is she's lived this life because of the family's commitment not to marry amongst the Canaanites. So it's a very weird story in the sense that, you know, she sees this play out, uh, you know, maybe again, one of the reasons why she didn't have good feelings about Esau is because of this. Um, but, mm -hmm. but, but we're left with a family dynamic where, you know, essentially, if it wasn't made clear to him in the first place, is it really Esau's fault, you know, for, for doing this? Um, you know, we're, we're we have an issue, which is that the authors and the and the agenda of the Bible is to present Esau in a negative light. We know that. I mean, that's a that's implied in this in in the text to some extent. But but he's not written off. And I want to tell you that you know it's my belief that Esau, even though he gets treated sometimes unfairly in the midrash, he sometimes um, is uh looked down on by by uh tradi by traditional authors and even by uh you know commentators more religious commentators today will look at Esau as a purely negative character the bible doesn't treat him as a purely negative character there there are aspects of his life where like this where you say well he tries to do the right thing he seems to care about the blessing even in that version of the story we have he doesn't seem to be disrespectful to his father on the contrary, he, he seems to be wanting to take care of his father. Um, so he, he's not, he's a more complex character than, than, than some people would have him be. And he, and to us, he represents, I think another aspect of ourselves to some extent, the aspect of ourselves that, that especially uh, as Jewish men and speaking as a Jewish man, that we, that we don't come to terms with a lot, which is, the more physical sides of ourselves, the more, the more, um, the more likely to play sports or to go out hunting or to, to do the things that, that oftentimes are seen as 
more masculine aspects of, of ourselves, which in Judaism were always put down. And, 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 you know, we all make jokes about, you know, Jewish athletes and that men, Jewish men weren't supposed to, to do, you know, to, to excel in sports or to do those kinds of things to have, a, to have a, a any kind be of, more intellectual. Yeah. And, and it's study. not, and it's not served the Jewish people. Well, this type of, um, this 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 view of it and again some of it was self-imposed because we we wanted more intellectual people but but it also was to some extent if you're not allowed to own land right and if you're not right. allowed to hunt and if you're not allowed to have an army and if you're not allowed to train for battle and all the other reasons why remember every olympic event that we had in the ancient world was based on war right you know whether you could throw a discus was you know it was a weapon if you throw a javelin it's a weapon you know, all of these things wrestling, we're all training for battle. You don't do those kinds of things. Do, should those be the kinds of things that you, that you accentuate and that you develop in your community? And so Esau was marginalized somewhat intentionally so that people would look at, look down on it. And you know, I was, uh, I was thinking, uh, cause I was, I've been watching this TV series called um, Troy, the, the fall of a city. And, um, and I was thinking about the the Greeks and and their stories and how this is these are their their biblical stories and that um, these these things that these stories are are about their values of what they think a man should be and that it, he should be a hero and a warrior and I was then comparing it to Abraham like and who is it, what is what is a Jewish good man look like and it was that he he would have, um, he would be like God fearing, right? That he built these, the, and he, and he owns property, he owns land and he has, um, and, and also he's pretty militarily savvy. I mean, King David is, is pretty military savvy too. And remember Abraham, we read the story. He goes to war and gets Lot, rescues Lot from battle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that so it's not like there's better. it's not like there's not a basis for it, but we didn't focus on that part, right? But then when you think about what makes a great Jewish man today, it's not about whether it, it's it that he's educated, that he's he does social action. I mean, like what our values, there's a thread, but our values of what it is that makes a good man has changed. Yeah. Where it doesn't matter so much how much property we we own or, or whether or not we're strategic in battle, but whether or not we are like, you know, care about people and, and politics and, and we're educated, those things are valuable. But those I think come with the rabbi. Yes, and of course the rabbis being by nature, people who are um, more concerned with, 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 with scholarship, Yes, those were things that were not that were not um, uh, stressed. But again, in the rise of modern Israel and a, and a Jewish army again, you know, I've argued before, and you've heard me say it, that it's time for us to reintegrate this the mm -hmm. Esau side to our lives, which is that we absolutely that we we you know look, I spent you know I thankfully I I felt well enough today to to and and this week. I've got back into exercising again this week. And I will tell you, you know, to me, it's an important part of, 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 of understanding who we are to make sure we pay attention to our physical health, our physical bodies, mm -hmm. and to also understand that, that being strong physically is also, um, is also, I, I believe part and parcel of having self-esteem and also not being afraid. And I think you know, it's one of the reasons why, you know, when we talked about it in the last couple of weeks, even more so, you know, it's why, you know, I'll go out on, 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 on a gun range to make sure that, you know, maintaining my skills for self-defense. Look, I, I believe, hopefully you never have to use your, 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 you never have to use your physical strength to defend yourself, but we have to be able to defend ourselves. We cannot simply rely on our on our in uh, our intellectual pursuits or, or our, uh, or it's not our enough strategy. anymore. And it's and and yeah, and so I I it's I never been it's enough. Time, it's, I believe it's time to reintegrate. It never was, but we didn't have a choice. And now that we have a choice, now we have that ability. I believe it's time to welcome Aesop that side of us back into our lives. And yes. remember that it's not healthy to have that split. And that and again, as I said, there's this Kabbalistic understanding that 
when we have a twin that actually it was meant to be one person that maybe Jacob and Esau was, you know, split unintentionally or, right. or mystically to actually split apart these two people that really needed to be one person. And, um, and that Jacob Esau person today is a, in a modern Jew, both men and women understand that there's a, a physical component and a mental component that both have to be strong for us to be healthy people and for us to have a healthy self-esteem. And, uh, and I believe that that's, you know, we have to, we have to have that. So that would be my, my, my uh, ASAW lesson, which is, you know, let's not, let's not marginalize him. Let's see him for what right. he is and also see him for that side of ourselves. And when we get to this next stories of Jacob and ASAW, when they finally come back together, understand that again, maybe, maybe that's the hope of the Torah too, that it shouldn't be that we just dismiss him and send him off and say, right. we're not going to be like that. So next week. You know, it's interesting yes. when you say that too, because then I think about what Jacob has to do with when he comes back. I mean, he has to battle that angel and he does win. He does, he gets his hip torn, but he does pin down the, the man, um, not angel. We don't know if it's angel. It said man, but he pins him down. He, he, does, he does battle him and he has, he has gained enough strength to be able to to win that fight before he comes home yep so maybe right. that is him embracing his esau and keep that in mind as we get to uh, when we get to that part of the story um as you notice we're actually next week we're going to come back and hopefully again be in person some of us will send out an email to give everybody confirmation of that tomorrow but our hope is that we have a hybrid next week that we're have some people in one room and some people, and hopefully it'll work. Um, but next week, as you notice, we're actually beginning a new portion. So the Jewish break here actually makes a lot more sense than yes. the break that we have in the uh, the Christian scholars gave, which is uh, to to have this these parts as part of another uh, another you know another chapter. So, um, oh, so when you go to the place though where it says the line of Esau. Um, the the women's names are changed where is that that was well you're skipping ahead right so that's, that's, yeah, in, chapter, not, that's but, in chapter 36 <laughs> i believe so if you yeah. go to chapter 36 uh this is the line of a dome so this is what you're talking about and so yeah it says, esau took wives from among the canaanite women ada yeah uh, the daughter of alone the hittite and oh holy bama the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zebion, the Hivite. So yes, those are slightly different names than the names that we had yeah. earlier on. And um, then it has um, a Bama. How yeah, do you? Basim, Basima, the daughter Basima. of Ishmael. See, in the other one, Basima is the daughter of Elon, the, the Hittite. And here, Basima is somebody else's daughter. Yeah. And again, to... Uh, to show you what we just read, because again, we usually don't pay attention to Esau's wives' names, but uh, it says right here that um, I have an attachment. <laughs> that he, that he, yes, and that he, it, it says right here that he took to wife Mahalat. So you know, again, the rabbinic answer was that these were nicknames, right? That they were people have more than one name, which is why Hagar is Katura, you know, later on that she has that, that new name. Um, but again, it seems as that there, there are slightly different versions. Now, I mean, the scholarly answer is, you know, the, the biblical scholarship is that chapter 36 is a whole different author who, um, and when we get to it, which we'll get to in a few weeks, the bigger question, my friends, and again, it's actually kind of actually it's a perfect opportunity now to end with what I just said. Maybe the list in chapter 36, where we actually pay attention to Adom's descendants, is there so that we pay attention to Asa, to Adom, and that we don't write him off. Because you can make the argument that chapter 36, an entire chapter of the Torah that we read, that you and I still read, that some bar and bat mitzvah kid in some you know, for every generation who's had to read a list of Edomite kings, what what's this doing in our Torah? That maybe that is actually the point. Chapter 36 is the point that actually 
that's the chapter that proves my point, which is we right. shouldn't we shouldn't dismiss Asa. That Asa is important to our story and is important to us as people. That we don't dismiss that side of our lives and we don't dismiss those people, and we do so at our own peril. Because I will tell you in that list on in chapter thirty six that uh, Sarah brings up, we do learn of a very important person in that chapter thirty six. Amalek, the Amalekites, the people mm -hmm. who become our ultimate enemy. And so we can make the argument that if we dismiss Esau and we turn away his family and we turn away that side of ourselves, we risk our own lives because Amalek becomes our enemy. And if Amalek never had existed, we wouldn't have had this perpetual enemy that's always our a thorn in our side, the Amalekites, who go to war against us during Moses's time and who are still at war with us during Samuel's time and who, again, according to the sages, according to the rabbis, every generation, there's an Amalek, whether it's the Nazis, whether it was the Crusaders, whether it's the, the Hamas today, those are called Amalek. Those are the people who are dead set of destroying us as Jews. And um, we're, we actually to some extent, and again, this is a rabbinic midrash, that we created that problem by, by treating his family like garbage. So keep that in mind, and thank you for, uh, for bolstering that point, which is that Esau should not be uh, thrown out, that Esau should be embraced and, and at least uh, understood as being a part of who we are. All right, folks, in the meantime, please stay healthy and safe, and um, I hope that everyone has a, a, a great rest of the weekend, a great Shabbos. And I, I so hope that we at least see some of you back in person. Joyce's group hopefully will be back in person soon as well. And we're looking we're forward first, to we're starting again. Excellent. So everybody stay safe and healthy and, and, and have, again, have a great attitude uh, and, and please enjoy life, everybody. Take care. We'll see Bye. you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.